Alright guys, this is Daniel Mirabal. You might have seen him in my videos. He's a certified arborist from Chicago, Illinois. And this this is a guy I really look up to and respect. What equipment do we use? Well, we use an air spade. So the air that comes out of the air spade comes out at Mach 2, which is 1,200 miles an hour. So every Mach is 600 miles an hour. It's like harnessing the power of the jet in your hand. I've gotten stories like, my tree doesn't look good, and I tell them I don't think we can do much for it. And they're like, you don't understand, you gotta do something. And I'm like, what's the deal? And they're like, you don't understand. My boy brought that tree home on Arbor Day when he was 12. That was 32 years ago. When my boy turned 19 years old, he got hit by a drunk driver. And that's all I got left of my son. You got to find it. I don't care. Try. I met him back in 2015. And he's very wise when it comes to being a proactive steward of the urban environment. So he's going to walk us through and give us some of those, some of that, that knowledge and the tips, bro. Drop some nuggets. Some nuggets. So I guess we should tell everybody where we're at, yeah. right? So we're at Denise Vidash's um, annual customer appreciation barbecue gala that she puts on every year at her Pontiac location, uh, Green Acres Tree uh, Farm, and uh, also Retree, which you'll learn more about that as time goes on, what Retree is, that's repurposing of trees. But yeah, so we're kind of walking through her yard uh, where she keeps her material and landscapers can come in in the local uh, uh, Tri-County, Macomb, uh, Oakland, Wayne County area and pick up uh, some more mature specimen uh, trees, especially evergreen trees. So that's mostly what she's, you know, uh, focused on. So bigger evergreen trees. Right. Yeah. But then you get stuff like this. Yeah, uh, I actually have this in my front yard landscaping. Tell me about that. It's a Korean lilac. Yeah. And it's on a standard, we call it, which is just means it's been grouped, it's been grafted on to another tree. So these are two different different plants. This is the rootstock of what looks like uh, a cherry tree, and this is the actual shrub grafted on. So there's a whole process where you cut into the the rootstock of one, uh, the, the parent rootstock, and then you stick a cutting in of the plant, and they have to gra they graft together. And there's a process, there's a tape that you use, a special kind of tape, what? there's a hormone that you put in, so those two will meet and marry each other. And then of course they've got to be compatible. And that's as much as I know about that. It's just a thing. Um, but they re do require a little bit extra care because this, this is called the graft union right here, yeah. where these two things come together. And there can be some issues that can develop in this in this area over time. So this isn't necessarily a tree that'll live, you know, be hundreds of years old. Can, but it, it does require a little more extensive care. Yeah. Yeah. So why is the root ball so big? Well, there's standards that you've got to follow. Um, so many inches per diameter inch or caliper inch of tree, and there are standards, uh, best management practices, uh, standards that we follow, specifications, I should say, not standards. There's specifications uh, that you should follow. So at least a 10 to one, you know, ever, a 10 inches of root ball for every uh, inch of caliper yeah. of tree. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's why. Yeah. Hey, these over here, these use Taxes Hicksai. Taxes Hicksai. Yeah, Japanese. Because uh, they look so different. How much, I, I just bought there's these. There's several uh, different varieties. There's Hatfields. Yeah. There's Densiformis. There's Rapandans. There's uh, Hatfields. There's Hicksai. Hatfield is very similar to Hicksai. Yeah. Uh, they, I don't think they grow as big. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, really cool. And uh, because they're evergreens, do they need more or less water than your average bush or shrub? They can dry out in the winter yeah. because they are an evergreen. So yeah. they're kind of doing their thing all year long. Um, so they, they can have a tendency to dry out. Uh, they can also get winter burn. You just get ex excessive cold temperatures and a lot of wind. And it sucks all the moisture out of the plant. Uh -huh. Yeah. So 
even in the winter time they may require some watering if we go through an extensive period of no snow no rain it gets kind of get some warm days uh -huh. in the winter time yeah early february is a bad time it happens a lot it seems more and more that's happening with our climatic crazy changes and i think that's going on all over the country it's going to be 80 degrees in michigan like the 13th of february and then yeah. april it's like freezing or frost and i see that all the snow. plants start blooming and then they freeze yeah. and mm -hmm. they're in shock and then... right and once they start to come out of dormancy yeah. you know the roots start looking for moisture uh, and then they get shocked and yeah they have problems so that happened with boxwoods in the chicago land region uh last year a lot of boxwoods got cooked 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 wow yeah what about this tree uh, over here? This one's beautiful. What is this? This is a beach. A beach? A beach. I need to pop up my energy. <laughs> Man, this one's a beach? It's a beach tree, yeah. So it's a nice tree. Big root ball. You know, they put the plastic on to try to keep the moisture yeah. intact in the root ball so it doesn't dry out. Obviously, you don't want to plant um, this in the ground. But a lot of care has gone through. So uh -huh. that's one of the things that are, you know, Denise and I resonate on together is she understands the necessity to make sure that root flare is exposed when she's doing this kind of harvesting. So, you know, she's she follows really good nursery practices. So the root flare being exposed. Right, so the root flare is a transition zone between the trunk of the tree or the branches of this multi-stem tree uh -huh. and the roots themselves. So this area in between is a transition zone known as the root flare, the root collar, yep. the root crown, and that area should be exposed. Uh, all this wants to kind of stay dry. Roots want to be wet. Two different types of tissue. And when you don't, when you bury all this, this is when you have, uh, you can develop a lot of problems. I see you on your Instagram all the time. Uh, too lit Latino for you. He uh, shows pictures of people with mulch on trees. Can yeah. you talk about that? It's volcano mulching. We need to think of donuts, not volcanoes. And by that I mean, or a bagel even, is, is a depression in the middle. And if you're gonna put mulch, the mulch needs to be higher at the ends than it does in the middle. And usually it's the other way. It's, it's more buried, like a crown at the top, and then it's nothing going down. So we need to do the opposite of that. From a, from a pruning standpoint, and I don't want to call out Denise, because um, she probably didn't have the opportunity to do what needed to be done, being that this was um, repurposed from somewhere else. Um, there's a lot of pruning that needs to happen in here. Uh, the crossing branches, branches yeah. Crossing and they right. rub. What happens when they rub? They can cause damage, yeah. which can lead to other issues, introduction of pests, disease, and the tree goes into decline. And it just doesn't live as long as it wow. should. Wow. Yeah. So, Learning so much. What is, want, uh, what's that? I want to get my, my pruning saw and go to work on it. He, he's itching to. I know. I'm itching to go in there and do some work on it. What's this? Uh, that is a. Uh, feels like a fir. I don't think it's a spruce. It's awfully soft. Yeah. Are those these belong in Colorado? That's Colorado blue spruce. Oh, okay. So this is, I think this may be a white spruce, actually. Because I see them here Norway. in Michigan. Those are, Nor those are Norway spruces. Oh, okay. Yeah, we have Midwest spruce decline. Spruce decline? Colorado climb? blue spruce. Is that where they're like, the needles are all brown and falling off and there's mold all over the place or fungus? Uh, funguses, yeah. We have needle cast funguses, stigmina, uh, rise of fear, needle cast. Um, other problems that we're having are uh, cytospora. Uh, canker, Cytospora canker, canker, yeah. Ah, it's a, okay. it's a, it's a fungus of the resin of the tree, and then it kind of oozes out of the tree, yeah, and then drips on the branches, and it causes for other problems. But when that kind of stuff happens, then we get this um, introduction of secondary insects. So, and that comes with my, with my, with my new thought process about reducing the use of pesticides in the urban forest. We're doing a lot of pesticide application, you know, sprays. But we got to think about why we're doing the spray. Are you doing the spray because you got a secondary insect? Well, maybe if you fix the problem. How come I wasn't told any of this stuff? I don't mean to cut you off, but I feel like the silly landscaper running around trimming trees and which I know I know I already said that, but every time I get around this guy, my stomach's like this. He's well, and that's what being a certified arborist is. So if you want to become you know, a certified arborist, this affords you the opportunity where doors will be opened up to you yeah. so you can learn more. It's a craft. It's, an, it's a never-ending craft of learning all these different skills. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty amazing industry that we're in. Very multifaceted. It's like an octopus with a lot of tentacles. <laughs> what about, uh, you see all these? What are these shrubs? 
Uh, these are Stuya. Stuya? Yeah, white cedar. I have customers all the time that don't like how they, and they want us to chop them and make them flat out. Is that I bad? think these are Green Giants, actually, if I'm not mistaken. Green Giant Arborvitae. Yeah, Green Giant Arborvitae. Um, you, know, you know, one of the things that I want to talk about with this, a lot of times you get storm damage in this. And the reason you're getting storm damage is they have multiple weeds. So you see how, see, Denise has gone through great lengths to make sure that she has good single stem, yeah. a single leader yeah. um, evergreen trees. And a lot of times what you'll see in garden centers is you'll have trees that have multiple, multiple canes, we could call them, or stems. Yeah. That's actually a defect in the tree. So if you're going to the garden center and there's like this, this, side, this area off to the side where they're giving a bunch of these away at a discount, it's probably because you're defective and some landscape architect or even a certified arborist like me has advised someone not to purchase those because they're full of defects. So she goes through on the front end to try to avoid all that, making sure that her trees have really good structure. So if you're looking for specimen larger uh, um, evergreen trees in the Thuya family, um, Green Acres Tree is, is a great place to come. She makes sure that she looks for these defects. When I go to the nursery by my house, I don't see bushes this big, dude. This is crazy. That's for sale. Yeah, How for long sale. has this been here? Um, I don't know when she brought it into the yard. More than likely, it was this spring that she brought it into the yard. Um, but well, you how long has it been growing? Semi truck. Oh yeah, absolutely. Have you seen her semi truck? No. So she has a semi truck. She's got a Peterbilt, and she said, you know, most girls have want Louis Vuitton bags. She goes, I wanted a Peterbilt semi. She got me. That's pretty dope. That's dope. It is dope. <laughs> <laughs> this Japanese maple pomatum it's got that more uh, straight up and down but you know when I so this was one that was repurposed uh, from someone's house so I look at it from the arborist perspective it's been topped multiple times in its life by that I mean it's just had heading cuts where the, 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 the way to prune it was just the buzz off the top and when you do that when you, when you just make an arbitrary cut anywhere on the branch especially in things like maples you just get this uh, epicormic sprouting you know, multiple sprouts come out at that end of the cut because the tree wants to repair itself it doesn't like that it was cut that way it's like an amputation you know you need to do it at a joint so when you take hedge trimmers on the top of the tree like this and you just cut it down into a perfect it's not yeah no, it's, it, it shortens the lifespan of that tree now some clients want that um, I've said this before, I, I, I just don't do that. I get requests to do all kinds of things to trees and plants, and I, I know what the long-term implications of doing certain things are, and I just have built my business, and my model is in a space where I don't have to do everything just to get a check. I feel very, very fortunate. I feel like that, that to me is wealth, that I can walk away from certain things that I don't feel is right to do that I know long, will have long-term impacts. So I work on my skills as a communicator and an educator, self-taught, to go get information, then learn communication skills through leadership programs like the Society of Municipal Arborists, uh, Municipal Forestry Institute that I've attended. Um, that is to learn communication leadership skills that will be beneficial in urban forestry so that I can communi with, communicate with a client and say, you want this tree to be around for an extended period of time. It's full life, right? Usually the answer is yes. Okay, here's how we should prune this tree, manage this tree, care for this tree. And if at the end of the day they say, I don't care about that, I just want X to be done. You know, some people say, you pay me whatever I ask and I'll do whatever you want. I, I don't, I just don't agree with that. I'm not saying if you do that, that that's bad. I just don't, I can't sleep at night if I do that, so. That's I like kind it. of my thing, you know? And that's not to disparage anybody else. Like, you know, you gotta feed your family. At the end of the day, you gotta feed your family. So, you know, fortunately, I just, I don't have to do that. All right, so what's next? What's the long-term vision of this? What's down the road? For me personally, my business or like the green industry? Yeah, like the whole green industry. And where do you see all this going? Why is it so important to learn all this? Well, we're, we're in this age of, like I said before, Anthropocene, where man, we're in this age where man, people on this planet have touched the environment more than ever, good and bad. Trees are important part of harnessing the bad as much as possible with the good benefits of trees in urban built environments 
So the bigger picture is to, to do this repurposing of green material, taking care of the trees that we do have, managing existing green spaces to get people to be more um, responsible. Um, I'd like to speak more on responsible development. Mm -hmm. So you get you get land that was naturalized, we come through, we wipe everything out, we pull all the topsoil off, we get down to hard pan, we make the soil anaerobic, which means we just compact it so there's no life left in it. And then we gotta put a tree in there. See, and everybody on the other end is like, oh, this is an opportunity to plant trees and make the space nice and beautiful. But what we, people don't realize is that when that happens, if they don't care for the soil, care for the land before the tree goes in, the tree suffers and it's, it's, its shelf life is dramatically lessened. And then when the trees get sick because they're stressed, then we come in with all these chemicals that aren't good for the environment either. We're spraying chemicals for pests and insects that were brought in to the landscape because we didn't get it right on the front end. So the bigger picture is the education of all of this and being able to look at it from a multi-dimensional view. Like I said, this industry, it's like an octopus, multi-tentacle, multi you know what I'm saying? So we've got to go back to the beginning. We've got to look at what we're putting into green spaces. Certain trees just don't belong in certain environments, in certain places. It's not just about we like have, when they we have build a, blank, a whole new subdivision and just put like whatever like a thousand of the same tree yeah a monoculture we call that a monoculture so we look at the example of that with the american elm and then something like dutch elm disease comes through wipes out that popula population and then what do we do then we throw all ash trees into the mix and then the emerald ash borer epidemic hits and then you lose all the ash trees but every time that those things have happened, the first thing we do is we run to the chemical application to try to subdue and suppress this. So in the case of like Denise and what she does, she's looking at this stuff as multidimensional, trying to bring in different varieties of plant material to try to mix it up, right? And that's kind of what we need to do. It's not cookie cutter. There's so age diversity, there's species diversity, there's all kinds also of different diversity. So the urban diversity. environment has to a replicate or sit what's going on in real nature yeah instead of having a monoculture right where one sweep of infectious fungal disease wipes everything out wipe everything out yep. which is catastrophic or the uh, people uh, uh, that spray a fungicide kills everything yeah or you kill all the beneficials kills all the as well. insects yeah and then there's collateral damage of that so let, let's use the pesticide application as an example you do a pesticide application that kills all pests it's a butterfly butterfly effect. You've killed all the insects now. So now birds don't have anything to eat. You, you've driven the birds away who may be a part of a deeper layer, deeper level in, in, in the environmental complex. Feel what I'm saying? And, and, and this, is, this mimics human, human life in the urban environment, in the built environment. We are diverse, we are a diverse people. Right, skin tone, ethnic, creed, oh, sex, religion. Yeah, we're all throwing the wrapper out the window. We're, we're all the we're all diverse, and and in our landscapes, our urban forests have to mimic that diversity so we stay healthy. So the the, the environment stays healthy, people stay healthy. Can't live forever. I get it, but man, you can sure thrive while you're living. It's a choice. I feel it's like a spiritual calling on your life. You speak coming from a place of having so much morality and purpose do you well, feel obligation to i this feel thing? obligation to give back to an industry that saved my life this very land that i'm standing on this very location is where i came when i was a 19 year old kid who was lost and didn't know what direction it was going to go in but was in this industry I, I done been cutting grass, I've dug holes, I was planting stuff, I was putting down cobblestone, I was edging beds, I was weed whacking, I was I was picking up shrubs. You worked here when job. you were a kid. I worked while well, I was 19, yeah. And he worked on this tree farm. Yeah. When you were a kid. Right, and for for Denise Vidash's dad and two other guys, uh, Wayne and Bruce White. And two now brothers, they were all full partners. circle, you're all grown up, you got your own business and everything. And I'm, and I'm right it. back where I started. I am right back where I started. And I didn't seek it, it sought me. 
So what is the universe telling me? The universe is telling me I gotta come back to center and I've gotta use this and I gotta give it back. It's a, I have a fiduciary responsibility, obligatory, to give back. Some people will resonate with my message, some people will not. So my mission is to go out and find other people. If you're not, if you're not feeling what I'm laying down, then I go find someone else, maybe you feel what they're laying down, and you gravitate toward them, and maybe they take you on to the next part of the journey. And I'm only here for whoever wants yeah. to kick it with me. But I will find somebody that resonates with you. All right, guys. Daniel Miraval here. This has been awesome. And check out, we just did a podcast on the Untrapped podcast on all major platforms. you got to listen to that, too. Yo soy el Lorax Mexicano, the Mexican Lorax. I speak for the trees.